So one of the things that Jamie did in her role at the CIA was prepare presidential briefings. So those things that presidents get to read and no one else does. But the candidates get a briefing now too. Is that the same as what the president is gonna get in January? What, what's that process? The way it works is that um, each candidate, once they receive their party's nomination, gets an intelligence briefing. And it's kind of a scene setter. The idea is to make sure that when they take office, if they were to be elected, that they don't hit you know, November 9th without any understanding yeah. of these issues. And that in the final months of the campaign, they're not talking about things that are, are incorrect. You know? right. um, but what happens after uh, the president is elected, uh, the president-elect will get exactly the same daily briefing that the president, uh, President Obama gets. So I always wonder about this, and let's say the candidate briefings that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are getting. Is that really anything different than if I was a avid reader of foreign policy journals I wouldn't already know? On the candidate briefings, there will be a fair amount of intelligence included. Um, Topic-wise, it would be the same sorts of topics, North Korea, China, Russia, cyber issues, terrorism, the Middle East. Um, but the overlay is the intelligence. What won't happen until they become president-elect is really deep uh, lay down of what intelligence operations are going on around the world. Covert operations, so you knew what was going on covertly everywhere. And as we were talking last night, you have to make sure the president knows that before he, he or she loses interest and in, you know a phone call comes in or something has to be done quickly. Is there an art to it? I was saying that the, uh, you know, the president usually gives like 30 minutes for his intelligence briefings, but if he gets the phone call at the five minute mark, you have to make sure that you covered the most important thing in those five minutes. Um, so you try and do a variety of, of pieces, items of, of interest. Um, some are very tactical, what happened overnight that he needs to know about. Um, some are more strategic in the sense of, you know, where do we see this problem going? What are the next steps that you need to be thinking about? And sometimes it's um, the intelligence community has the function of needing to do indications and warning. Um, so here's a warning, this is not on your radar yet, this is a problem. Can you tell us an example since, you're, since time has passed or? <laughs> One of the ones that I remember um, explicitly was for President Bush, the first time we went in and talked to him about Darfur and what was going on in Sudan, we put Darfur on a map and put an outline of the state of Texas on top of it. <laughs> so that in a heartbeat, he could see exactly how big this area was and could understand and relate to it. And I think, I think that's a challenge for every new administration, finding you know, how is this president going to react to information, take it in, make sure that they have a briefer who meets those needs and, and, and is not somebody that they hate to see you know, darken their doorway. <laughs> So, um, who's ever president in January is going to get this first briefing. In those briefings, what makes you most nervous? Subject matter, um, I think that, you know, obviously the first briefings would be focused on where we have U.S. troops on the ground and in harm's way, because that's always the first um, order of business for a new president and a commander in chief. I think some of the issues that need to be brought into those briefings um, are things that aren't really being talked about on the campaign trail right now. Really in between WikiLeaks and Access Hollywood, we haven't discussed North <laughs> Korea. I, I, exactly. <laughs> and I would put North Korea on as one of the, the issues that we are not paying enough attention to. So we, we've talked about this a bit uh, in an earlier panel, but. Um, what is, you know, you read that they will be a nuclear threat to the continental United States within five years. Describe the threat and our defenses. Okay. The president-elect is going to face a problem from North Korea that none of his predecessors or her predecessors have faced. Um, it will be, it is well on the way to becoming not just a nuclear power, but a, a power able to deliver a nuclear missile. Um, not to go into the entire nuclear cycle, but there are two paths to getting the nuclear weapon, the uranium route, the plutonium route. They've, they have 
achieve both. Um, the next piece you need is a, is a delivery system. Now you can drop one out of a plane as we did during World War II, um, but mostly what people look at are missiles that can, can carry a warhead. Third, and they have perfected many aspects of the, the missile uh, capability. There was a failure this weekend. It was their Lucidon rocket. That's the one that we think can hit Guam, certainly as a threat to Japan and to South Korea. Um, so something to, to ver be, be concerned about. And the fact that these things are, these rocket launches are failing shouldn't give anybody comfort because they're not failing for the same reason. They fail, they fix that thing. It might fail for another reason, but they're advancing um, in terms of their capability. And they can hit the continental United States at some point. At some point. In, in the not too distant yeah. future. The Lucidon can probably hit Guam, um, but the next, the next larger rocket will be able to hit the US. Third piece you need is a miniaturized warhead that you can put on top of a missile and actually have it fly. And then the one piece, and, and we believe that they have made uh, progress on that. South Korea says that they have, have perfected that. And the piece that's missing um, is right now to hit the continental United States. You would have to go into space and then re-enter, and they have not perfected re-entry. That's well, interesting. So the whole re-entry technology, they have not perfected yet, but they're on their way to, um, what should we do about it? You know, I think this is one, uh, one area where we can work very closely um, and privately with China on understanding the dimensions of this problem. I think in the United States, we say that China has the most leverage on North Korea, and they do have leverage because they provide some power supplies and, and other uh, assistance. But really, they don't have the kind of leverage that they used to have with um, the current leader's father. So I think the Chinese, the Americans, certainly South Korea and Japanese need to start working together on trying to figure out what to do about North especially, Korea. But also, especially when you're dealing with a, a clearly irrational regime and irrational leader. I mean, is there, are there lessons in how to cope with that? Well, you know, it's difficult. You want to shut down their ability to carry out their intentions. So one of the things that's being discussed now are the, the type of sanctions that we put on Iran that ultimately brought Iran to a negotiating table. Um, I'm not equating the regimes yeah, I was gonna say in those two countries. Yeah. Um, but those types of sanctions, which were much more uh, invasive than the current sanctions on North Korea, you're now, talk, you, you're now hearing um, a lot of talk about applying those types of sanctions to North Korea. So another aggressor that we worry about is Putin. Um, how worried should we be going forward? And that the next president in those briefings? I think if I were in, in those briefings, I would be saying this is not a new Cold War. Um, that implies that Russia is a superpower and one of the two superpowers that we had during the Cold War. Um, that is not the case. But it is, it is accurate to say that the relationship between the United States and Russia is worse than it has been at any time since the, the mid-1980s. Um, so before the fall of the wall. Um, I don't think that relationship is going to improve anytime soon. Um, Putin will be there for a fairly long period of time, I'm sure. Um, and what he is doing is um, achieving his goals. And so he wants to reestablish Russia as a great power. He has brought them back into the international stage in ways that countries cannot ignore them, whether it's on Syria, Ukraine, um, issues like that. Um, he's also doing things that are very popular domestically in Russia. Um, you know, this is you know, giving Russia pride in the fact that they are back and they are being considered a major player in the world stage. So for the next president, um, I don't think a big, bold, strategic opening with Russia is going to get them anywhere. I think they'll have to look for issues where we have common interests, um, where we can work, you know, probably behind the scenes initially together and then try and develop baby steps. And we have to worry about the cyber thre threat as we've seen that's now entered our political system. Right. Out of yeah, and I think that's um, absolutely uh, occurring. I think the hacking is very serious. 
Um, you know, at Kissinger Associates, one of the things we talk to our clients about a lot is not only how to deal with Russia, but you know, issues like the cyber threat that's posed uh, to their companies. Um, on an individual basis, um, all of these hacked emails that have come out, whether it's John Podesta or Colin Powell, um, I would say to each and every one of you, if you have 10 years of emails sitting on your computer, you are making a big mistake. <laughs> so, um, and and how, you, how do you treat devices when you travel? You d don't take them with you. I take a, uh, last night I used the phrase a burn phone. Um, that's from my former life. Um, a clean phone with me um, that does not have my contact list on it, has only the numbers I need to have, does not have email addresses for all of the people that I know and all the clients that I have. Um, you feel a little naked out there because yeah. you don't have that at your fingertips, but because you don't have it at your fingertips, they don't have it at their fingertips either. So you have to be really careful. It's a, the cyber threat is a personal threat too, I mean, in, in your personal data. It is, and that's how m many of these attacks, these hacking attacks occur. They don't go through the corporation it, it, they'll try, but they often don't succeed that way. But they do find a way to get in via the individual. So you've gone from the CIA to, um, which is just so cool, to um, global business consulting. What have you learned from being in intelligence that's applicable to decision makers at the top of global businesses? Well, I think the problems are, are very similar. You know, if you're a global business working in China or Russia, the Middle East, you have to deal with issues that are beyond your control. Um, you, you don't control the geopolitics of the situation, and yet your industry, your company may wind up paying, um, being caught in the middle on some of these issues. You know, one of the concerns right now is, you know, a U.S. firm, does it now carry all of the baggage of this presidential election? Um, when I think about what I learned at the agency that's applicable, it was, uh, stuff I didn't even know I, I knew at the time. Triage, a, an ability to really triage information. Hmm. You know, what's important, what's new, what's old, what's the same. Um, and the stuff that's new and different from what my, my thinking was, that's where I wanted to spend my time. Um, crisis management. The first reports you get in on a crisis, whatever the business is, um, if my experience is accurate, first reports are almost always wrong. How, how many of you have that experience in business? Your first reports when you're in a crisis. Look at that. That's amazing. Yeah. I uh, think that's exactly good advice. And so you know. So you how do you contain? How do you resist? I mean, it, it takes. It, there's an art of discipline, particularly when you have pressures yeah. from, you know, customers and shareholders, everybody. Um, how do you resist that? Well, in the government, you have pressures from the president and from Congress and the media. Yeah. Um, you just have to be disciplined. Don't overstate. Don't try to extrapolate what you think probably happened. Until you know what happened, don't say it publicly. Um, you know, say you're looking into it. You know, ask for the time to get the full set of answers. Um, make sure you talk to the person who was actually there not the person who reported it to the person who Good reported advice. it to you. Um, and, and really don't go beyond what the facts at the moment tell you, even though the facts may change. That's a great piece of advice. Unfortunately, our time is out, and um, I hope we can carry on this conversation. In the hallways outside, um, feel free to talk to Jamie about whatever's on your mind. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you.